It is a joy to be in the house of the Lord and give thanks. I want to ask Terry Magel to come forward now and share a ministry moment with us. Terry is the chair of the board of directors of our local food pantry, and he has some good words to share with us today. Terry, welcome. Next Sunday, November 3rd, First United Methodist Church, along with 30 other local churches in our community, will again participate in the ecumenical food drive to stock the emergency community food pantry. The members of First United Methodist Church have been instrumental in supporting the food pantry since its inception in 1982. Records show that First United that year donated $750 which was used to stock the first groceries on the food pantry shelves. In its first year of operation, the food pantry provided a three-day supply of groceries to 745 people. Forty percent of those were children and or infants. It did that with an annual budget of $2,812. While the numbers have changed dramatically since that time, the food pantry mission has not changed and has remained the same, feeding hungry families and children in our community. In 2012, the food pantry gave a seven-day supply of groceries to 7,976 people. 43% of those were children and 30% were senior citizens. With a budget of $78,000, groceries were provided that prepared 166,677 meals. On behalf of the Food Pantry Board of Directors, I ask that you continue this 31-year tradition and help us to continue to feed the hungry in our community. We humbly ask that you bring non-perishable grocery items to church next Sunday. We will have uh, a couple of nice shiny trucks in front of the church to collect them. We will also gladly accept monetary donations made out directly to the food pantry. The food pantry is a 100% volunteer operation. It is tax exempt. As a result, all of your donations will directly feed hungry families. Thank you again for continuing to show your faith in Christ through your generosity to this critical, life-saving community mission. Thank you, Terry. Appreciate that. Thank you. As Terry said, that's one of the big things that's happening next week. And I know that our church has been so faithful in our uh, support of that great ministry. You've got it started. And so uh, the 830 service said, uh, just one, or I said to them, just one truck, that's it. Church our size, we ought to be able to do at least two. And they said, we'll challenge the rest of the church to do two. So uh, anyway, it's a challenge, and uh, we'll, we'll see how we do on that. But we look forward to participating in it. Now, friends, let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord.
Continue the call to worship as printed in your bulletin. The Lord be with you and also with you. Sing praises to God, O you saints, and give thanks to God's holy name. We exalt you, O God, for you have restored us to life. We may cry through the night, but your joy comes with the morning. You hear us, O God, and you are gracious in our distress. You turn our mourning into dancing. 
Our souls cannot be silent. O God, our Savior, we give thanks to you forever. Now let us stand and praise our Lord by singing hymn 163, Ask You What Great Thing I Know. I want to invite our children to come forward now and join me on the front pew here. Come on, guys. Come right on. Everybody, you all can sit in the front pew. Everybody sit down. Come right on over here. You're good. Everybody have a seat on the front pew. Today we're going to do something really special, and we're going to do a baptism. Do you know what that is? No, some of you do. Some of you do. We put water on their head. That's right. What else? You know? Well, we're going to have a special time. It's where God brings people into the church. We welcome into God's family. And it's a very, very, very special thing. Many of you have been baptized. And I wanted you to be here, to be on the front row, to have a front row seat to watch what happens today, okay? Later on in the year, we'll have a time where we'll remember our baptism. And I want you to participate in that as well. I do have one reminder about something, that I, a project that I need your help on. Every year around Christmas time, we do a program called Operation Christmas Child. And it's where we're going to give you a little box, and we'd like for you to put certain things in it and bring it back to church, and we're going to send it overseas so that other persons around the world can have a Christmas from you. And I want you to participate in that. And our boxes, Miss Tanya has got our boxes located throughout in the vestibule area here. So parents, if you want to help, make sure they get one. Uh, they're going to be turned back in by November the 17th, and so you just got a couple of weeks to get that together. So will you take care of that? Okay, now here's the deal. I need you to be on your best behavior, okay? And stay right here. And then when we're done with the baptism, then we'll let you go to your children's church, okay? Little church, all right? Now, I want to invite the family of Aaliyah Simpson uh, to come forward. Their sponsors and grandparents and whoever else is coming, I want you to come. I want you all to come up here so we can see you guys. That's good. That's good. The rest of you can just gather around here. 
I'm just gather in. That's good. I want the, hy- the congregation to turn to hymn 2249. And let's sing together. invite the congregation to turn your hymnals now to page 39 and join with me for our service of baptism. I'm going to ask Roy to come and assist me here. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. And we are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation. And we're given birth through water and the Spirit. And all of this is God's gift offered to us without price. Today it's my honor to present to you Aaliyah Simpson for baptism. Amy and David, I ask you these questions on behalf of the whole church. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness and do you reject the evil powers of this world and do you repent of your sins? And do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever form they present themselves? And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ is open to all people of ages, nations, and races? And will you, uh, will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example she may be guided to uh, accept God's grace for herself and profess her faith openly and to lead a Christian life? And do you, as Christ's body, the church, do you reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? And will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include all these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their service for others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Friends, let us stand now and let us profess and confess our faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I And do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Be seated.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and you brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those in the ark through water. And after the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. And when you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your Spirit. And he called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and this one who is to receive it to wash away her sin and clothe her in righteousness throughout her life, that by dying and being raised with Christ, she may share in your final victory. All praise to you, Eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with you in the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns forever. Amen. <clears throat> Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm getting ready to really make you mad. Aaliyah, Karen, Tamer, Simpson, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's all right. I want to place your hands on it. <laughs> Aaliyah, being born of the Holy Spirit and water, may you be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. What a blessing. Look how beautiful. Bless your heart. Let's sing the last verses, and I'm going to take uh, Aaliyah to meet her new church family. I want you to meet your new sister. It's CQ. Let us pray. We give thanks, O oh God, for your gift of, and sacrament of baptism and for this opportunity to share this special moment in Aaliyah's life. We love her and we lift her to you as a great blessing to all of us. We do affirm our responsibility in her life this day and we give you thanks. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. <coughs> Amen. God bless you. Better. You did good. Okay. Thank you, Dave.
Let us pray. Loving and holy God, we thank you again for the opportunity to celebrate in, in the sacrament of baptism and to experience your presence in a powerful and mighty way. Oh, how, how wonderful and merciful you are, O oh Lord. And today, as we gather to study your scriptures, we pray that your wisdom and understanding would be upon our lives. Bring us into a new, a new place with you. Grow us in our faith. And may the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable to you now, Lord. In Christ we pray. Amen. A while back in a band that I was playing in, our lead guitar player was playing and broke a string. I asked him, I said, do you want me to go get you another one? And he said, no. In fact, he said, I'll play one string if I have to. <laughs> I think sometimes we focus too much on the strings that dangle in our lives, you know. I call them the inevitables, the inevitables that happen to us. It's that when the car won't start and you're late. It's when uh, you're taking your kids to a school activity and you're sick. It's when your teenager comes home late. Maybe even worse, maybe it's a divorce that you don't want to want to happen. Maybe it's someone that you have lost in your life. I call them the inevitables, and I, I, we don't have a choice over these things. We can't control them. But friends, I want to proclaim to you today that we do have one string left. In the Scripture, on your note page, well actually it's not on your note page, I want you to take a pencil and write this in because I want you to have this Scripture. It's an important one. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Just write that down. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. I apologize, I inadvertently left that out of the bulletin. But it's the key to getting us started today. In the Scripture, the Apostle Paul writes here in this Scripture, and he says... Have this attitude in yourselves, which it was also in Jesus Christ. Wow. How do we have an attitude like Jesus Christ? Well, to do that, we have to be transformed by God's grace. And we have to change the way we think. And that's the first step of being transformed by God's grace. Changing the way we think. You might write that down. In Romans 12, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, Do not change yourselves to be like the world, the people of this world, but be changed within by a new way of thinking. And then you'll be able to decide what God wants for you. You will know what is good and pleasing to Him and what is perfect. That word change, friends, it means transform. Actually, to really get at the meaning, we've got to go back to high school. High school biology class. Do you remember that experiment that we did in that glass case? And we put those caterpillars in there and they, they made a cocoon. And then it wasn't too long and they came out as beautiful butterflies. What they call that? Metamor metamorphosis. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> and I'm not even going to ask you to write it down on your note page. Uh, but that word means change, and that's what we're talking about here. We are metamorphosized, and I don't even know if that's a word, but we are metamorphosized by God's grace, friends. It's like we step into God's cocoon of grace, and we're changed, and we're transformed. It's like that father and son. You may have heard about them. They're over here from a third world country, and they're experiencing all that we have to offer here in the United States. Uh, not long ago, they were shopping shopping at one of our popular malls. And they were excited and enthralled with all that they saw. But on this one particular day, they were standing in front of these walls, walls that would open and close, open and close. They were fascinated. What is that? I don't know. This, the, boy, the father's son said to him, Dad, do you know what that is? The father said, no, I've never seen anything like it. The doors would open or the walls would open and people would get in. And the walls would close and they were gone. They're standing there watching for a while and, and an elderly woman, bless her heart, she came very slowly over there to those walls and she pressed a button they hadn't noticed before. And the wall opened and she stepped in. The wall closed 
And they were looking around and they noticed numbers above the wall. One, two, three, and then it paused. And then it went backwards. Three, two, one. And the door opened and out came a 24-year-old beautiful woman. <laughs> and the father, without hesitation, his eyes got big and he looked at his son and he said, Go get your mother. <laughs> yeah. Men, what can we say? <laughs> Well, a very shallow man, maybe. But the process is right on because this is what this word kind of means in Romans 12, too. It means changed. It means transformed. Our biology teacher would say they're metamorphosized. Transformed by God's grace, okay? The second thing that we need to do is we need to choose. Write this down. We need to choose to focus on others. We need to choose to focus on others. In Philippians 2, verse 4, Paul writes, Do not be interested only in your own life, but be interested in the lives of others. You know, friends, our society today, our world today, is telling us to do something very different. Our world tells us we want to focus on me, focus on, you know, us. Yeah, our problems, we want to focus on my opportunities, my this, and my that. I was in a Books a Million store one day and I found a magazine that I thought would epitomize life in general. It was a book called Life. Several years ago when they used to publish that magazine, you remember, life, they talked about life in general, they talked about problems, talked about successes, talked about difficulties, talked about failures. It was bigger, if you will, than life. I looked a little further and I came across another magazine. I got to thinking, you know, if life is too large for us, maybe we can start focusing on people. Hmm. Life is too big. We want to focus more on us. We want to talk, we want to just talk about people and specifically about our people. A little further, further, even a little more specific, I came across a magazine called Us. You know, we don't want to talk about life. We don't talk about people. We want to talk about us. Talk about our attitudes and our problems and our intricacies of life. We want to talk about us. And, and I looked and looked and I couldn't find a magazine called I. But I did find one called Self. Can't talk about life. That's kind of generic. We want to focus on people. And if that's not enough, we just want to focus on us. And I really don't want to focus on us. I want to talk about Self. I looked through that magazine. Interesting. It was 38 pages longer than life. Hmm. How do they do that? You know? I don't know how many people actually pick up that magazine based on some of the things I read in it, but I was looking through it and I found out for the first time that our hair has five enemies. Did you know that? I didn't know my hair had any enemies. Bless your heart. Our, it does. That's what the magazine said. It said the sun is an enemy, a blow dryer, Hard water, mm. pollution, and last but not least, hair stress. Bless your life. You know, if your life is in such turmoil that you have hair stress, <laughs> you know, I, I'm sorry. That's just tough. Wow. Life, people, us, self. You see, that's what the world wants us to narrow the focus down and get it right on us. And yet God says, no, 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 no. I want you to look at others. I want you to focus on somebody beside yourself and make a choice to do that. I know a school teacher named Miss Thompson. And every year, year when she met her students, she would say to them, boys and girls, I love you all the same. I have no favorites. And of course, she wasn't being completely truthful, as you know. Teachers have students that they, well, they like more than others. Oh, let me be honest with you. They have t students that they just don't like. And Teddy was a little boy that Miss Thompson just didn't like. His hair was unkept and his clothes, they, they had that musty smell. He was certainly wasn't an attractive little boy. He wasn't likable. When she got his papers, she got a certain pleasure out of marking X's beside the wrong answers. And when she got to put an F on his paper, she did it with a little flair. You know. 
She had Teddy's records, and the truth was she knew more about Teddy than she wanted to know. The records said, first grade, Teddy shows promise with his work and attitude, but he has a poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy could do better. His mother is seriously ill. He receives little help at home. Third grade, Teddy is a good boy, but he's too serious. He's a slow learner. His mother died this year. Fourth grade, Teddy is very slow, but well behaved. His father shows no interest. Christmas came, and the boys and girls brought presents for Miss Thompson. You know how it goes. They piled them on her desk, and there was one there from Teddy. This was a gift that was wrapped in a brown paper bag, if you will. It had scotch tape on it, and it had the simple words for Miss Thompson from Teddy. When she began to open the presents, she came to Teddy's, and out fell this gaudy rhinestone bracelet. It, half the stones were gone. And, out, uh, and also a half of a bottle of cheap perfume. The truth is, the boys and the girls in Miss Thompson's class began to laugh over Teddy's gift. But she quickly put on the bracelet, and she sprayed a little squirt of the perfume on her wrist, and she held it up for the boys and girls to smell, and they took their cue from her, and they responded with, oohs and ahs. Doesn't it smell lovely? Yes, Miss Thompson, the children all agreed. At the end of the day, when school was over and all the children were leaving, Teddy lingered behind and finally came over to her desk and he said to her, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. And her bracelet looks real pretty. I'm glad you like my present. And when Teddy left that day, Miss Thompson got down on her knees and she asked God for forgiveness. The next day, the children came to class. They had a new teacher. Miss Thompson was changed. She had become an agent of God. She was now a new person committed to loving the children and doing things for them that would live on after her. And She helped the children, especially Teddy. And at the end of the school year, all the, t all the students had improved. And Teddy, in fact, had uh, caught up with everyone. In fact, had passed or passed some of them. But that's not the end of that story. Ms. Thompson didn't hear from Teddy for a long time. And then she received a note that read, Dear Ms. Thompson, I wanted you to know that, be the first to know that I'm going to be graduating second in my senior class. Love, Teddy. Four years later, she received another note. Dear Miss Thompson, read, they just told me I'll be graduating first in my class. The university has not been easy. I wanted you to be the first to know. Love, Teddy. Four more years. Dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard II, M.D. How about that, it wrote. I wanted you to be the first to know, and I'm getting married next month, the 27th to be exact, and I want you to come and sit where my mother would have sat if she were alive. Dad died last year, and you're the only family that I have now. Love, Teddy. Miss Thompson went to that wedding, and she sat where Teddy's mother would have sat. And you know, friends, I think she deserved to sit there because of the time and the effort and the allowing of God's transforming power and grace to metamorphosize her, if you will. I guess you could say when it came right down to it, there was Miss Thompson and one string. I think sometimes, friends, we focus too many hours on the strings that dangle in our lives when we've got one string left. We need to play it, friends. We need to play it with all of our heart. And the Bible says we need to invest in others. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. We need to choose to focus on others. The third thing, let's do this. We need to charge through our quitting points. Write that down, if you will. Charge through our quitting points. And what is a quitting point? 
You know, if you're a runner and you're in the 20th lap, any runners back here? I know some of you are. If you're in the 20th lap and your feels, knees feel like rubber, and then you're at that physical quitting point. Maybe you're at the job and things are overwhelming you and you're dizzy with all the work and your boss comes and he gives you another assignment. You're at that vocational quitting point. Or maybe you're in an argument with your husband or your wife for the ninth time over the same thing. And one of you says those magical words that sends the other one bolting from the room. You're at that marital quitting point. Maybe you're up at 12 mid, 12 a.m. Your teenager is supposed to be home at 10, 10.30, and they walk through the door and you ask them, where have you been for the last hour and a half? And they announce to you, it's none of your business. Maybe you're then at the parental hitting, I mean quitting point. Maybe we have a great relationship, a great week with God this week. Feel like He's in control of our life. And then, bam, the inevitables hit us. The strings that dangle from our instruments, the strings that dangle from our lives. We feel like maybe even God has abandoned us. He's not near us. And we're at that spiritual, suddenly, quitting point. You see, friends, here's the thing. It's much easier to quit something than it is to continue. It's easier to walk out of the room than stay and resolve a conflict. It's easier to skip church and enjoy a nice day at the lake. It's easier to play than it is to practice. It's easier to watch TV after a long day at work than to spend time with your family and your children. It's easier to do what you want than what God wants. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 3, he said, I, st I am still not all I should be, but I am bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God is calling us up to heaven because of what Christ Jesus did for us. You know, friends, adversity helps promote endurance. And the Bible says, and we've talked about this before, we can rejoice when we run into problems and trials, for we know they're good for us. They help us learn to be patient, and the patience develops that strength of character. How many times? Well, I don't know, and I'm going to tell you many more times. God is not interested in your comfort. God is interested in your character. Lastly, let's chart a course for growth. How about that? Write that down. Chart a course for growth. In Psalm 119, it says, I have thought much about your words and stored them in my heart so that they, uh, so that they would hold me back from sin. I wrote on your note page there, memorize, personalize, and analyze. Three things that we need to do. The first thing is to, is, the pers is to memorize. This week, I want you to take your bulletin home, put it somewhere where you'll see it every day, put it in your car, put it in your bathroom mirror, put it, uh, I don't know, maybe on your refrigerator, and look at that. Don't leave it in the pew, but look at that, okay? And think about what I've written there about each day of the week. Memorize, first of all, God's Word. Some of you say, Phil. I used to memorize, but I can't do that anymore. I can't even remember my own name hardly. Well, give it a shot, will you? For example, on Monday, when you roll out of bed tomorrow, when you get ready to start to work or start your day, your feet hit the ground, grab these notes. Have them in your car, in that mirror, wherever, and start to memorize. Look at that first verse. Why should I be concerned about my future when the Bible says, quote, I say this because I know what I am planning for you, says the Lord. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I'll give you hope and a good future. What more do you want, friends? God knows our future, so let's give it to Him. How about that? Huh? Memorize. The second thing is personalize. Look at the Scripture. Change the pronouns. You see, Tuesday, uh, why would I be afraid? When the Bible says God did give us a spirit that makes us afraid, did not give us a spirit that makes us afraid, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Just change the pronoun to I. Why should I be afraid when the Bible says God did not give me, or I, give me a spirit that makes me afraid, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. See, God has given us that power and that self-control, and we need to personalize that for ourselves. 
And that last thing is analyzing. Analyzing life situations as they come into light is what God's Word does. What does it say about God's Word? It's a light unto our what? Anybody remember? It's a light unto our feet, right? The light's the path in front of us. That's what God's Word does. And by putting God's Word in our hearts, when we get bumped along the way, we'll have a clear focus of where we need to go. Hmm. Stephen Curtis Chapman, he wrote a song called The Great Adventure. And I know some of you have suggested that your lives right now are great adventures. A lot of things going on, the inevitables of life have happened. But Stephen Curtis Chapman's song goes like this. The chorus says, saddle up your horses. It's a Western thing. Saddle up your horses. We've got a trail to blaze into the wild blue yonder of God's amazing grace. Let's follow our leader into the glorious unknown. This is life like no other. This is a great adventure. I think you will agree that with all the things that are going on in our lives right now, we have some important choices that we get to make. I think we should be excited about what's going on in our lives. I think we should be excited about our great church and what God is doing. Even if we get down, though, to that one string, let's play it for all she's worth. This morning, you may find yourself in a situation in your life where you're down to that one string. It's okay. Keep playing. Keep playing hard. But that's a choice that everybody gets to make. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you for the choices you give us, and sometimes they're hard. But we also pray today that your blessing would guide us and direct us and move us in a direction where we can follow you. Transform our lives, O oh Lord, by your great and wonderful grace. Thank you that you know us and can do that. We pray this with confidence today in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, I want to invite you to stand with me and join as we respond to the word by singing the first and last verse of number 338, Where He Leads Me. Let's stand and let's sing. Friends, as we gather here from many places in our world today, we gather to share our prayer concerns with the Lord. And so let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. We thank you, O oh God, for this great day and for your presence as you come and you transform us and renew us and change us. 
We thank you for the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ and what an honor it is to gather to worship and glorify his holy name. We thank you for our sisters and brothers and for the fellowship we share. And in this place, O oh Lord, we strive to be encouragers of one another. We pray, Lord, that you would take away our, our bent of looking at ourselves and move us, move our eyes around so that we can see others. Let our hearts be open and let us know that we're in this uh, thing called life, this journey of faith together. We thank you, Lord, for you know our lives and you know our prayers. You know the concerns and burdens that we bear. But today you call us to cast those burdens upon you. And so today we think about those that are sick and hurting. And we pray for your blessing and your healing. What a blessing it is. We thank you for that uh, through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the comfort that you give us as we grieve in that void that's in us. You fill it with your love. We thank you for that. We thank you, O oh God, that we're in life. And yes, some days we only have one string left. But Lord, we're thankful that you continue to encourage. You continue to walk with us and, and mind us and guide us and direct us. And so thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to be your disciples, to be the church, and to be your people in this world. And so bless us now as we join our hearts, as we join our voices, and we share together the prayer that you taught your own disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our ushers are coming forward now. And so let's prepare ourselves to celebrate with, with great joy uh, an offering, an opportunity to give thanks for all God has done in our lives. Holy and merciful God, uh, you have blessed us beyond measure. And today, as we offer our gifts in celebration of all you do, we pray that your blessing be upon us. Use these gifts for the glory of your kingdom and the work of the church. In Christ we pray. Amen.
blessed? Do you feel blessed? Yes. Well, let's sing. Blessed Assurance. We'll sing the first verse, and you probably don't even have to get out your hymnal. You know this song. 369, Blessed Assurance. Just do the first verse. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of my spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. God, as we go from this place, may the blessing of Almighty God, our Father and Son and Holy Spirit be upon us and give us your peace, peace that passes all understanding. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. God bless you.